station. This is Houston on two. Are you ready for the event? Station is ready for the event. CNN, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is John Berman with CNN. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard Space Station. They, does it go? They hear me? I couldn't. Uh, I can't hear them at all. We can hear you. And we have you loud and clear. How do you hear us? I hear you, Station. Thanks very much. I'm going to read a brief intro. We're going to play some sound, and I'll ask you some questions. The Apollo 11 NASA mission put a man on the moon for the very first time. It was a crowning moment of human innovation, intellect, and achievement. Now, as we approach the 50th anniversary of the first lunar landing, the award-winning new CNN film Apollo 11 brings us a breathtaking look at that historic mission. astronauts, Expedition 59 flight engineers Anne McLean and Christina Cook. They are both flight engineers aboard the International Space Station, and they're taking a break from their mission to have this conversation with me. It is such an honor to speak with both of you. And Anne, before we get to talk about the Apollo 11 landing and the significance of that, just tell us about your mission. Well, as you mentioned, uh, we are currently aboard the International Space Station, which is an orbiting laboratory, and every day we are partaking in hundreds of science experiments here on board for the benefit of mankind to explore our universe and learn more about our planet. Uh, I've been here for about six months, and I go home next week, and Christina has been here about three months, and uh, she's got a long stay, actually. Uh, she'll, be, she'll be up here for about another uh, six or seven months. Uh, so every day we are conducting science and exploring our universe. So, Anne, we look forward to seeing you on the ground. And as for you, Christina, uh, Anne just mentioned you're staying up there till February on the space station, which means you would break the record uh, for a female, an American female being in orbit, and you would be up there for the second longest time any American ever has. How daunting is that? How do you prepare for that 328 days? Well, I prepare for it by remembering that it's not necessarily the total number of days that you're here, but what you do with each of those days. So remembering that I would love for this record to not only be an inspiration for future space explorers, but also a way that I can pay homage to those that paved the way for me to be here doing what I'm doing. It reminds me to bring my best every single day to the work that I do up here, the work that brings benefits back to Earth, that explores space further, and that um, pushes the boundaries of science on the frontiers. So that's how I prepare for it, by remembering that the significance of it um, has ramifications both for the future of space flight and for the inspiration that's happening right now, hopefully, during my flight. 
and it is inspiring and inspiring for me to get to talk to you up there. And Christina, you, you'll be up there. Anne's coming home. But you will be up there for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 lunar landing. Just reflect on what that moment meant to what you're doing now and what it meant for human innovation. I think at the time it was a moment where the entire world united and stood in awe, um, observing not only the accomplishments that humanity could do when it came together, but the sheer awe of the celestial um, aspects of the fact that humans were standing on the moon. I think that it showed us that we, as humans, love to do great great things together and to take on great challenges. And so reflecting on that during my time here, I remember that that same spirit motivates NASA today and motivates each of us every single day that we are here on board. We're really looking forward to paying homage to our heroes that have inspired us throughout our lives, those people that were involved in that mission and that made it happen and made it reality. And we're going to be commemorating that wonderful day here on board with in a variety of ways um, and hopefully using it as a platform to remember um, how important that the work we do here still is and also to highlight the fact that we're going back to the moon by 2024. Well, exactly. Let me ask Ann about that. By 2024, NASA has just announced they want to put humans back on the moon, including the first woman uh, to land on the moon. What's the significance of that? Well, I think historically, uh, obviously, it would be a significant achievement uh, to, uh, you know, as one of my heroes, Jerry Cobb, said, to explore space uh, with no discrimination. And, uh, and so it'll be significant, uh, whoever that woman and that next man is on the moon. Uh, now, personally, at our level, uh, we are so focused on our job and the mission and training for it, uh, uh, you know, that uh, we haven't gotten too caught up in it uh, quite yet. But uh, it certainly is inspiring uh, that we can pursue those paths, that everybody's going to have a seat at the table in this next, uh, in this next phase of our space exploration. Do you want a chance to walk on the moon? I think all of us would. I think the, uh, there's millions and millions of people on Earth that would uh, jump at that opportunity, and we're certainly fortunate uh, uh, to realistically have shot to be, uh, to be one of those people. Uh, I, I wish you the best of luck uh, in getting in a front of the line to be that first to land back on the moon. Before I let you go, and it's been such a pleasure to talk to you, Christina, can you just explain the Velcro pants? Because I think you might start a fashion trend here on Earth. Well, this, um, I don't know if I would uh, hope this for anyone on Earth. It's not necessarily fashion. It's what we call a function over fashion, actually. So here um, in space, obviously, in microgravity, we have to use our hands to get ourselves around, to float around the modules, because our feet, uh, we don't necessarily walk around. We just grab handholds and mo move ourselves around. Um, which means that we need our hands free to do just that. So in order to carry anything around, we have to Velcro it to our pants. Thanks, Ann. <laughs> so again, uh, we definitely look to function over fashion, and I'm sure that's pretty apparent <laughs> here. I, I think it looks cool. I think it looks cool. I thank you so much for, uh, for being with us, demonstrating that, and sharing with us this remarkable moment in history as well. Christina Cook, Ann McLean, I really appreciate you being with us. Thank you for your time. We've enjoyed it. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the CNN portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from Our State Magazine. Station, this is Jeremy Markovich from Our State Magazine. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. Good to talk to you today. Good to talk with you, too. I, I can't thank you, you both enough for uh, taking time out of your busy schedules up there at the International Space Station to talk with me. And uh, I, I wanted to ask you both uh, right off the bat, I understand if I could scrape together enough money here in the future that I might be able to come up to the International Space Station and, and, and join you or your colleagues uh, sometime in the future. So if, if I were to come up, I'm just wondering kind of what is daily life like up there. 
Yeah, that's a great question. We are certainly excited at the possibility of the International Space Station getting to be opened to uh, more people, commercial industries, more researchers, more astronauts, and more just curious people. Uh, our typical days uh, are really, there is no typical day. Um, I guess, I suppose uh, the most typical is that we work about 12 hours a day. And here on the International Space Station, which is a national laboratory, uh, we have hundreds of science experiments going on every day. And we may come in physical contact with just a handful of those every day. Uh, you know, we could be changing out samples or installing or uninstalling an experiment that's, that's new to run. Uh, we also spend a lot of time maintaining the space station. If you figure this is kind of like a, a large home, a large 3,500 square foot home, and it has its own plumbing system, an electrical system, an air conditioning system, and uh, those systems are extremely complicated. They're autonomous systems. And so we interact with those systems every day, so we perform maintenance. Uh, and then uh, we have to maintain our health every day, so we do exercise every day. Uh, and the tourists that come up to the space station, uh, you know, it'll be really interesting to see what things they get involved in or maybe the, uh, what projects of their own that they can bring. Well, it sounds like you both are, are very busy, you know, a lot of the time. And I'm wondering just how often do you get the chance to look out the window, whether it be uh, from inside or on a spacewalk, and just look down and just take in what you see? Well, as Ann said, we do have those 12-hour work days. So um, at the end of the day, we definitely can spend a few minutes unwinding by looking out the window. We have a beautiful, what I call the bay window of Space Station, and we call it the cupola. And in that area, we have kind of a 360-degree view looking down onto the Earth, and we can also see all around to the entire horizon or line around the Earth. So we get a few minutes each day to do that, and then, of course, on the weekends. And I think one of the things we enjoy the most is watching the Earth go by taking photographs of it and sharing that. It's almost a way to feel connected with the Earth, taking pictures of places that you're from, places you love, places you know where you know people who are living. So that's a great honor and something we enjoy a lot. In terms of spacewalks, that's a pretty rare event. On our mission, we've had three, and we've been a fortunate crew where all, all the crew members have been able to go out and experience and perform a spacewalk. So that is obviously another time where uh, if we can catch a few free minutes um, between all those that work that goes on for about six and a half hours straight, uh, we definitely take a second to look down on the Earth and appreciate the, the wonderful view that this position affords us. Christina, I, I, we here in North Carolina were all struck by something that you, you tweeted back on April 22nd, and it was the first time that you had actually gotten a view of coastal North Carolina, and you said it, it, it took your breath away. And as somebody who grew up in Jacksonville, North Carolina, and spent a lot of time in the state during your formative years, what's it like to look down uh, and see the earth from a place that maybe you, as a kid you spent a lot of time looking up from? That's exactly right. You know, North Carolina was where I was when the sky inspired me to seek the career path that I'm on right now. And now, interestingly, I look down on the place where I'm from and I find inspiration there. When the coastal area of North Carolina kind of came into focus around the horizon the first time I saw it, it, it did take my breath away because suddenly the, the places I called familiar, the places I had seen on a map a million times picking out where I'm from, the waterways that I would use to find Jacksonville on the map were all there and they were real. They weren't on a paper map or on a computer screen. They were on the earth and um, that was a very, very poignant moment for me. Um, one of the things that I wanted to express about that in particular with coastal North Carolina is the ocean um, is one of the first things that I look to for inspiration because in addition to the night sky and the beauty of the universe, the ocean is another thing that makes us feel small and ponder our place in the universe and kind of ignites that spirit of wonder and exploration. And Christina, one of the, uh, I know you, you went on from Jacksonville, North Carolina, and, and went on to Durham. You, you, you spent some time at the North Carolina School uh, of Science and Mathematics, and then graduated from North Carolina State University. And I wonder how those things led you to the path that you are now on today. 
Well, I think, um, as I mentioned, I found a lot of inspiration, first of all, where I grew up near the coast um, in the ocean and the exploration of the islands in that area. And then moving on to Durham, I basically had um, kind of the wider world opened up for me. It was a very challenging environment at that school, and I recognized that if I stepped up to those challenges that I could be successful and that the harder I worked, the more rewarding rewarding the gains were. So that was an exciting um, period. And then moving on to North Carolina State was just a place where I found so many different ways um, to, to explore opportunities, um, not just in the incredible science and engineering courses, but in the extracurriculars. That's where I got my start rock climbing, which is where um, a lot of the skills that I've incorporated in becoming an astronaut came in handy, not only academically, but in other realms. So really in all aspects, it kind of played into it. And I think most importantly, like Anne has expressed before um, in her growing up years, no one ever discouraged the girl from North Carolina that had a dream to become an astronaut, and I think that was the most important thing. And and one more question about North Carolina, and that is, you know, I, I know that you, um, it's going to be a little bit of, of a time before you're able to get back down to Earth, um, and I know that you no longer you no longer live in North Carolina, but I'm wondering, like to this day, maybe you carry forward from that time. What what, what part of North Carolina? is always in you even as you move on to really exciting things including space. I think um, one of the things that I carry forward with me are the values from North Carolina. You know, North Carolina is a place where everyone's accepted, in particular Jacksonville, North Carolina, where I grew up, being close to Camp Lejeune, is a very diverse town. And the open-mindedness that I grew up with around me and the appreciation for diverse views and, um, you know, living with people and around people from all over the world, those are things that have informed me from the time I was very young and that I continued to take forward. And and also just the basic values of North Carolina, I think I rely on a lot um, in my career and interacting with people. You know, this, this year is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, and I'm wondering what, how you both feel about being part of this amazing tradition um, that has started so many years ago and, and, and has led us to amazing places that you all are a part of here in present day, what, what it's like to be an astronaut um, and look back and see the origins and the beginnings of, of how all these came, came together. Oh, it's, it's a really incredible honor to be part of our space program at this time and really any time uh, since the space program uh, started. Um, I think uh, as astronauts, we, we always talk about perspective. We, we have this uh, unique uh, vantage point looking back at the earth and looking out at our solar system and uh, a lot of times what strikes me is really throughout the history of humanity how lucky I was and we were to be born at this time when we're when we can explore space um, you know if we had been born a hundred years before uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't be in space we wouldn't be where we are right now um, and so thinking about 50 years it seems like a long time but it was just yesterday that we were putting people in space for the first time and putting boots on the moon for the first time. It was only just over 100 years that we took to flight for the first time. I mean, the last 100 some odd years has been just absolutely incredible in the technology development uh, in flight and in space flight. And I cannot imagine where it's going to be in 50 years. Uh, for, for me personally, I am so proud to hold this baton uh, for the short period that I have it. I want to uh, uh, provide as much as I can to our nation and to our world in space exploration and then proudly hand that baton to the next person to continue this, uh, this amazing uh, human endeavor of space exploration. So I, I know you're going to be up in space for a little while longer, uh, but uh, you know, we, we, here, we make a magazine here, and I, and I noticed somebody somehow got a, a Joel Embiid basketball jersey up into space on the International Space Station. So if we were to maybe try to send a magazine to the International Space Station, uh, what's the address or how would we get it to you up there? If that doesn't work, we'll send it to you uh, when you get back. How about that? Yes, um, you know, it is true that we are able to bring a very small amount of personal items on board stations, so that's a way to have the comforts of home up here and to sort of remind us of our connections and to be able to reach out while we're up here. Well, 
Christina and Ann, I, I can't thank you both enough for, for, for talking with me today. And uh, safe travels, and uh, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. It's been an honor for us. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you, CNN and R-State Magazine. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.